to welcome all of you to our second, perhaps annual, uh, Over the Edge Fiscal Benefits Cliff uh, webinar. The Fiscal Benefits Cliff is something that is quite pervasive in our community. It is something that uh, we, uh, one of those systemic challenges that we hope to uh, find innovative solutions to address. And, and so we look forward to today's discussion. My name is James Green, and, uh, and I wanna welcome each of you uh, to this hopefully very insightful and, and informative session. Uh, we're excited about the, uh, the individuals and the panelists uh, that, that we uh, have uh, speaking with you today. We believe that the information that we gain from this session will be useful to you as you attempt to address some of the challenges that you may be facing in your profession or with some of the clients that you're working with. And so we're, we're just excited about uh, finding ways to, uh, to innovate and to work collaboratively as a community uh, to address the fiscal benefits clip. Uh, I want to just go ahead and pass it off to uh, the moderator for today. Uh, she's an individual that really needs no introduction to our community. Uh, Dr. Uh, Chris Kane uh, is the chair of the Citizens Advisory Committee on Health and Human Services. The CAC is a group of institutional leaders that come together to oversee the health and human services system of care. Uh, so if you think about each domain, whether it's housing, food and hunger, uh, employment, child care, all of the various services, behavioral health, health and wellness in general, uh, these system partners are coming together and they're looking within each of those domains, to make sure that the, the system is at maximum capacity and across domains because we understand the interdependent nature of, uh, of how these services work. And so Dr. Kane is there kind of leading and guiding the charge uh, to make sure that um, as system partners, we're working effectively together. But she's also um, a systems expert in a number of other collective impact efforts here in Palm Beach County. Uh, we are extremely excited uh, to have her leading this work uh, and, and working with us to guide uh, our efforts to improve our system of care. And okay. without any further ado, I'm going to introduce you to uh, Dr. Christine Kane, and she's going to, to take it from there. Dr. Kane. And if, if we could get everyone to mute uh, their phones or uh, if, if our host could mute everyone's phone with the exception of Dr. King's. Dr. King, you're on mute. Thank you, sorry about that. Good morning, everyone. I'm truly pleased to be with you today. As I'm sure you are, I'm really looking forward to this conversation on the fiscal benefits cliff with our esteemed panel of national and community leaders. Uh, before we dive in, however, I wanna give you um, some more context about this Palm Beach County Citizens Advisory Committee on Health and Human Services, the county's health and human services element and the CAC's goals in terms of supporting a comprehensive system of care. The CAC was established in November of 1990. Its mission is to assist the Board of County Commissioners in the assessment of need, planning, implementation, and evaluation of a health and human services system of care. We work very closely with county staff on that effort. The purpose of the health and human services element, which is part of the county's comprehensive plan, is to assist in the development of infrastructure to ensure the availability of health and human services sufficient to protect the health, safety, and welfare of Palm Beach County's residents. The element identifies the county's role in funding, providing, and or supporting the delivery of health and human services, and it also defines the county's relationship with other funders and providers of services 
for the purpose of maximizing the resources and benefits available to Palm Beach County residents. With this framework, the Health and Human Services Indicator Report then provides a snapshot of services needs for the CAC as we're considering recommendations to the Board of County Commissioners. So with that context, as you can tell, this is a very important topic to discuss. And so I'm really excited to facilitate today's conversation. During the conversation, we'll look at how the benefits cliff is being addressed nationally, COVID's impact on the cliff. We'll also we'll hear about a, we'll also hear about a new tool being developed to help mitigate the effects of the cliff and how other communities are using the tool, as well as how the cliff is impacting local Palm Beach County residents and some of the strategies that are being used to implement those challenges presented by the cliff. Before we get started, however, we would like to get to know who we have on the call today. So with that in mind, do we have the slide for, there we go, okay. Um, if you all wouldn't mind, please actually, if you wouldn't mind going to www.menti.com and entering the code 191318 and indicating what profession or sector you represent, that will give our panelists an opportunity to know who is participating today. Uh, I'm not sure if, Jody, can you check to see if uh, the, it says the question is not open for voting or wait a minute for the presenter to open? I don't know if that's just me. I think it's saying the voting is closed. Um, maybe uh, while we're getting that work, if you would just drop in the chat whether you are uh, working with the government sector, uh, you are a business professional, or you're working with the nonprofit sector, if you can just drop that in the chat, that will give us some indication of, of who, is, uh, who is on the call this morning. Perfect, that's super helpful. Thank you so much, everyone. So let's go ahead and get started because we've got a lot we wanna share with you today. I'd like to introduce our first panelist. Our first panelist is Dr. Josephine Hauer. She's currently a social science analyst in the Division of Strategic Planning at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Office of Science and Data Policy. Previously at the Administration for Children and Families in Region 1 at HHS, Dr. Hauer led strategic planning for the whole family approach to jobs, a multi-year and multi-sector public-private initiative in New, in New England. She provided technical assistance to states as well as federal leaders on cross-agency policy and practice strategies to reduce family poverty and promote social determinants of health to generational approaches. Her content expertise includes strategic planning, benefits, cliff policy and strategy, marriage and fatherhood, social capital, ACF collaborations with TANF, Housing and Labor Partnerships Development and Qualitative Quantitative Research. Prior to her federal career, Dr. Hauer has worked as a consultant, researcher, and doctor, doctoral faculty in educational psychology, research methods, and family education. Recently, she co-authored a regional report published by ACF entitled COVID-19, The Family, State, and Federal Policy Lessons Learned in New England. She's also the co-author of a text accepted for publication entitled Multidisciplinary Approaches to Diversity and Inclusion in the COVID-19 Era Workplace. I'd like to turn over the um, webinar to Dr. Howard. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, let's see. Okay, here we are. Hi. 
Okay, you can all see my screen. Yes. Yes, we can see it. Great. Okay, so um, I'm going to just hop in uh, because this work that I'm presenting today is really, I just went over to ASPE for a, um, a detail and it's really uh, the combination of an ongoing work of our uh, New England work at, at the Whole Family Approach to Jobs Initiative that we started this work funded by Kellogg with the NC, uh, National Conference of State Legislatures. So um, there was a long process because we had state teams and we developed analysis in a uh, New England region, where are the benefit cliffs issues in New England? And we ultimately produced a brief. So I'm gonna to present to you highlights from that brief, which give you an overview. Um, you can access the brief online. And um, we called it Moving On Up, Helping Families Climb the Economic Ladder by Addressing Benefit Cliffs. The work is ongoing because we have to update uh, a lot of information and strategies and, under, and approach both under this new administration, but also more importantly, the impact of COVID, because as you know, COVID has impacted communities and industries um, unevenly. So it's important to note that um, the framing of our work uh, under the last administration was about workforce shortages and we don't exactly have the same situation. So that, that's a very important um, it, to note. Uh, <clears throat> so as you may know, just briefly, uh, the cliff effect happens when families who are um, being supported by public benefits get an increase in earnings or income that is really has a negative impact on the net income that they have. And so there is um, calculations depending on what benefits someone has, where they are in which state. And it is perhaps very confusing to the customer and to the business, if they have a, a job at $15 an hour, or $20 an hour, why they're not moving up or taking a raise or even dropping out of their uh, job. So people often park themselves right at the cliff so that they are not um, negatively impacted. And typically, if it's a single mom, she'll care a lot about her child care or she's using that or housing voucher. Um, but as you know, there's a wide range of public benefits that can be impacted by uh, small increases in earnings. So when you think about the cliff effect, I would like to um, offer uh, what I felt the whole thing was when I started this work. It was, it's a big jungle and you have to tease out from where you sit ultimately where your area of impact can be. But there are areas of impact which can smooth out the cliff or solve cliffs either in one program or among programs for the sake of the customer at the federal, at the regional, at the state level, agency level, program level. And ultimately, there are many partners that should be involved in this process. So number one, there's no one size fits all. And it depends on where you sit, which tool in the toolbox or tools in the toolbox you may work on. Okay. So we need a multi-level approach. This work was done in the context of a six state initiative we call the whole family approach to jobs. And the benefit cliffs were one of the areas where the states um, and they continue to feel it is of utmost importance. The working group on benefit cliffs is reconvening because last year the state commissioners, human service commissioners, labor commissioners were obviously and appropriately very COVID focused. And we have to rethink through some aspects of benefit cliff policies and practices because of COVID. So one area is um, knowing your self-sufficiency standard in your state. Some states use the federal poverty level. Maybe some of you are familiar with the ALICE um, standards, cost of living. Um, so states have a wide variety and would it be beneficial if we had sort of one way to do it across the nation, perhaps, but that's not what happened. So I think, you know, the first area that cliff work should be addressing is enlightenment. So enlightenment, right? So increasing awareness and knowledge, whether it's to the business sector, to your state legislatures, to an advocacy organization, and of course, to the customer, to the families. So, um, 
one of the tools you'll hear about in depth from Alex today are uh, calculators. And this calculators are like a tool for greater awareness and understanding. And there are many different types of calculators and they have different purposes. So a calculator can be um, used at the case management level, such as the common calc in uh, Massachusetts, where they help a caseworker work to understand, to give better advice to their clients on what will happen if you take this job to your benefit structure. I think when people, and it's perfectly understandable, right? When you don't know um, how things will play out, you generally will go for the conservative, uh, protect yourself. Like we all wanna go into survival mode. So increasing awareness, both for the, the case worker and family frontline is so important. It's also important to increase awareness for um, businesses. People, you know, le business leaders may not understand why someone is not taking um, a raise, a modest raise, or a position increase, or hours increase. And they may be able to work with that person um, individually on solving some of these issues. So I, I think awareness is like the critical first step. And we can all increase awareness of benefits cliffs because, you know, if you just read a lot of papers on it, it can be exhausting and people need, you know, really quick, like, here's a story. <laughs> here's something to understand. So uh, also in, because of the federal benefit system, you know, you ask, well, where can we change policies, right? Well, in some ways you can change something at the federal level. There's a lot of things that can be changed at the state level. And Connecticut's an example um, of, a state that really has worked hard to create um, this framework in their two generational initiative. Because so that's where their cliff ladder or identifier and financial forecast tool is residing and it's under development. And uh, you will hear more about that from Alex. I don't want to belabor it, but the point I want to make is it's sort of embedded in a cross agency council at the governor's level in Connecticut. And while many states you know, are not ready to go there yet. And Connecticut has been working on these issues for, for uh, many, many years. It's important that they, they put it somewhere. So finding in your state where there is um, soft, fertile ground to work on benefit clip issues is very important because it's, it's different. And it's gonna be based on the stakeholders involved and who can lead on it and who's articulate and, and who can really uh, push something through. So it's couched in the two generational initiative, which is a bipartisan board, which it makes it very helpful because you can increase awareness and get buy-in once you have shared understanding. Um, oh, so another, I don't know why this didn't come out, but so this one is, think about assets. Many of our federal benefit programs have asset limits. These count toward income um, or eligibility. And assets are very important for people to move into the workforce and stay in the workforce. Programs with asset limits, including TANF, SNAP, Medicaid, and some housing programs. So some states have said, okay, let's expand our asset limits, um, like in Massachusetts from 2000 to 5000. And you know, you may think of, well, that's a very low hanging small fruit, but actually to a family, if you can increase an asset, whether it's savings or um, a car, you know, you can get a better quality car or whatever, that is, and it allows you to receive your cash assistance for longer. That's a very important impact. So it's important to like, think about a small change having a big impact on the customer. Okay, and uh, Vermont, for example, went from 2000 to 9000. Uh, and that's, that's very, that was incredibly significant in rural Maine. That's, that means a lot to people. So I think that's very important to keep what small change, and if we can't go for something huge, what small change can we make or push for um, that will make the biggest impact, like get the most bang for your buck. Another area is income disregards. And I think this area has some real potential. Um, it enables workers to continue receiving public benefits while their income increases. 
For businesses, this reduces employee turnover and for workers that they can stay in the workforce and provide for their families. So I thought Massachusetts implementing their earned income disregard of 100% for the first six months of employment while receiving TANF, as long as the family income was not over 200% of the federal poverty level. Again, it may seem small, like you can't leap someone towards self-sufficiency, but you can extend their supports as they build their skills, build their career pathway. That's again, very important. So L, uh, income disregards, I think are um, important to look at. And again, because some of this policy is at the state level, not the federal level, the specifics of it are very um, important. It's important for, how do you say? It's, it, the context will help you drive your strategy. So knowing these details is, is quite important. Um, if you wait <laughs> for TANF uh, to be reauthorized and fixed at the federal level, you'll be waiting how many years? Many years. Um, perhaps there is a new opportunity under this new administration and because of the impacts of COVID, we have seen more impetus at the state level to work cross-agency and collaboratively. Um, you could say under the last administration, we leveraged the language of worker shortage and, you know, businesses need to find the hard to employ. Under this administration, we may use terms like uh, inclusive recovery or the way to, um, you know, bring everyone up to more opportunity. So I, I think language and framing is very important and it depends on where you want to make your impact, whether that is at the federal level with your, you know, uh, representatives or at your state level or even in talking to businesses. So <clears throat> you can say one of the best things anybody could do for, from a systems and operations point of view is streamline application and eligibility processes. Now this these efforts have been going on and there are there are many and they're outlined in the in the brief um, in a detailed way. But under COVID you know, we saw human service departments shockingly um, switch very quickly and pivot, right, from paper face-to-face -to, -face to online uh, applications um, and required meetings and mobile devices. And, you know, one of the uh, projects I had under last summer was interviewing um, with my team uh, the whole human service commissioners and leaders in New England. And they just were all shocked that people went very quickly to telework um, and tell, you could say telemeetings, both in their staff and the families. Now, certainly some families are left behind, especially if they don't have broadband access, but there's there was higher engagement and there was greater um, staff, um, um, satisfaction with their job. And so these changes, our leaders are reporting, they do not want to go back. They want to have a hybrid system. Um, I don't know if anybody watched Xavier Becerra's um, uh, comments yesterday, it was the day before, but he said, we're not going back to the old ways. So you can anticipate that there will be opportunities um, for a lot more telework and online application processes and a, a strong interest in making things simpler for the whole system, for both efficiencies and for the ease of the families. Um, so one of the best ways, right, to reduce poverty, the tool and toolbox, which most of you know about is the earned income tax credit and the child tax credit. And I think, again, this may be a strategy for, you know, advocates, um, to say we can increase this now, or it's a, it's a great opportunity. So I, I, I know this is a common um, strategy that people already know about, but this may be a, a ripe moment to say, you know, uh, this is one of the most effective ways um, to address poverty for families with children, especially. What are some other strategies? Well, you can think about how to phase benefits out slowly by establishing sliding scales and gradually lowering benefit amounts. 
uh, learn to earn. You could say in Massachusetts is doing this in its own unique way. Um, HUD's family self-sufficiency program allows escrow accounts. And this seems to be a challenging area in federal regulation, but there may be some flexibility in your states. Again, knowing the details of your state policy regulations and practices is important. Also, an area where I think it's very important is engagement with employers. You could say businesses are an uncommon partner with human service folks, but in the area of workforce development, um, businesses need a lot more enlightenment and awareness of the impact of benefits on who's working for them and why they may be having trouble moving up or keeping the job. I think, again, this conversation has to be nuanced and revisioned, if you will, um, according to the industry and how uh, COVID has impacted that industry and also the, the training systems that people are now accessing online. So I think there will be some opportunity here to engage with employers and at the community level, especially. Um, I, know, I know New Hampshire is doing that um, quite aggressively. Career pathways, um, obviously training have been, has been uh, impacted by COVID and there are many different types of in-person trainings where part of those trainings were online. And we have to rethink about the growth op occupations and where there's opportunity for wage progression and getting people to those jobs. And that's where, you know, motivating uh, at the state level, addressing benefit cliffs, it, it can all be about getting people, you know, recovery from COVID. And I think there may be explicit opportunities moving up, moving forward. Um, maximizing potential income from both parents, and I would also say maximizing social capital from both, uh, from all um, kinfolk is very important. Leveraging child support and TANF to provide employment services to non-custodial parents is really important. Child support is often disregarded as income for public assistance. Um, so key takeaways, benefits impact employees' decisions and create dis disincentives to work or to advance in a career pathway. Small increases in wages definitely reduce net resources. There are a lot of potential strategies that smooth or eliminate the cliffs and benefit cliffs impact each state differently. Knowing the landscape in your state helps to determine which strategies would be most effective. Um, both New Hampshire, well, Maine had an economic analysis done by Stepwide Research. And so their legislation was based on that economic analysis done in 2018. New Hampshire had just contracted last year and had sort of started its economic analysis. And an analysis that really tells you things like, well, which benefits are most valued or most accessed by these working families and you know what wages um, in which industries um, are, are going to be the most affected. So getting specific in your context or your area of potential impact is very important. And some of these analysis, again, have to be redone uh, as we recover from COVID. So I hope this gives you some ideas to think contextually and think specifically and think practically and tactically about ways you can address benefit cliffs. And I would be um, happy to answer questions um, in the future through email or, or provide other resources for you. Thank you much. Thank you, Dr. Hauer. That was amazing. Uh, a lot of really great information. I'm wondering if you could maybe chat a little bit. You've suggested a lot of different ideas. Can you talk a little bit about maybe one strategy or a, a couple of strategies that you have seen that are most successful? Some of these are more challenging than others. So we're trying to think about like, where would we start? Well, I guess I would start with um, asset limits and, and TANF. If, and that, you see, some of this question is really about your state. Like where is some leverage points of your state? So you have to know all the details. But I would look at state policy around TANF where there are opportunities to align um, interests among workforce um, and engage different partners. Like if you say, well, to get some 
big thing at our state level we want like let's say something like connecticut has or new hampshire or maine like we want a sector in our legislature to really care about this you have to really back up and say okay what do they know about it is anything going on and how to approach it and that's where a lot of you know environmental scanning and understanding who the players on local partnerships who in your state is really leading on this issue and how are they leading? And you know, are they coming from one specific sector? And maybe you have to increase other sectors. So, I would say, you know, it's going to be harder to to get the big eligibility realignment, which we've been working on in ACF, right? We've been talking about it for years because it involves Congress, right? And uh, maybe we'll see TANF reform, uh, you know, worker requirements, these type of things, but. If there's opportunity now under your state's Economic Recovery Council um, under COVID, you may think about there on where you can potentially make impact. So there is no one size fits all policy. There, there really isn't. I think the, the, clip, the tools that um, Alex will talk about gives again, an agency level or a county level or a state level, something practical to do right now for, you know, to, to really impact the front line, but but the larger pictures of of getting state legislation and policy um, done is a longer term strategy. Does that That's help? really terrific advice. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think it also all of the examples you've provided have also given us some ideas of things we might try. So thank you so much for that advice. I do see that we have some questions in the chat. So. Um, one says here, can you share the slide with all the state departments again and elaborate on the effectiveness of that process? The state departments are the one with all the feds. <laughs> this, this one? Yes. Okay. Well, think about, um, this is actually an important slide because it, many people don't know, right, from the bottom to the top, how many federal programs are siloed and how that creates problems, right? So it's a complex situation. Um, let, let me give you a, a story. So I had a lawyer friend um, come to me and say, you know, my client who was in public housing and used to sit on a park bench, of, you know, every day got hit by a car when he was set, sitting on the park bench and he got a, a great um, uh, amount of money for this from insurance but he didn't want to accept it because it would kick him out of public housing. So that benefit would be gone. Like let's say he got $50,000. So he was, when he tried to look into, well, how do we solve this? He got overwhelmed and confused. And so he had to find another law firm who sort of specializes in this. So you got to really think about how the, how one in extra income, like a lump sum gain would impact someone and not just for housing, but it will impact the SNAP differently, Medicaid differently, TANF differently, because the, the eligibility requirement and the processes are different across them. I, I can, um, I mean, we did work sort of um, program by program, uh, which I can send out to people, sort of looking at all these complex issues because uh, they're not easy to understand. And you think, well, why did this happen? Well, it's because these programs develop, were, have their own history and then developed in silos. And so looking at program interactions is not something common we do in the federal government. Um, one of the things we were motivated to do, again, under COVID, because there was like a flood of flexibility that states could take, um, could take advantage of, but they also created some new cliffs, actually. And and program interactions that were uh, not thought about. So, you know, one good idea from the feds can have, as you know, multiple kinds of impacts downstream. Um, does that help in a nutshell? I don't wanna take up all the time, but that's, that's so. fundamentally the reason. And it does, it does lead us to another question that popped up in the chat, with, which was how will our COVID stimulus checks affect public benefits? Well, there you go. There is a new possible COVID clip. Also, I can, I can tell you an example. It's it's a little, the, the answer to the question is, um, 
person by person because again, their situation is contextual. Are they on childcare? Are they in a house to have the public housing voucher? Um, those kinds of things. Uh, we had stories um, of these family childcare, you know, small small family childcare. They didn't want to take the PPP loans because that would kick their family off some benefits. So a lot of our big policies have different impacts. And I think one of one of the things you can do if you are like in a community action agency is to report <laughs> stories and real anecdotes to people who are working on the issue because um, stories really do help. Um, and I think, especially around COVID, whether it's you know, the housing crisis coming up or these new uh, checks coming out to people, you know, nobody can sit down and predict how it will impact individuals, you know, before they do a policy. But hopefully we can get more feedback mechanisms. So you have to know who might you report to and share the story with the impact to, to get some at least information sharing. That's like the bottom level that everybody can do. Wonderful. Thank you so much. This has been a really terrific overview of the context at a federal level, national level, but also what you're seeing in various states. So we appreciate you sharing your thoughts and expertise on this. Um, are there any other questions? I haven't seen any other questions in the chat. I'll give you a second. If you've got a burning question, now would be the time for Dr. Howard. Okay, well, thank you so much, Dr. Hauer. Um, I'd like to now uh, move on to our next panelist. Dr. Reuter is a principal advisor in community and economic development at the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta, specializing in workforce development and higher education policy. Before joining the Atlanta Fed, Dr. Reuter was an assistant professor, tenure track in public policy and a center for innovation in higher education, economics of education fellow at the University of South Carolina. He's also held positions as a research project manager at the John J. Heldrich Center for Workforce Development at Rutgers University and as the Illinois WorkNet Business Services Coordinator at the Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity. Dr. Reuter's scholarly work has appeared in publications such as Economics of Education Review, Journal of Public Policy, the Journal of Public Administration Research and Theory, and Upjohn Press. So at this, at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Reuter. Welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, I mean, it's wonderful to be here again. Um, I, th I think some of you may remember last year about this time, uh, we also joined you to talk about the fiscal cliffs. And at that time last year, I just so everyone kind of knows, it really was at least more of an introductory talk on how the Atlanta Fed has been approaching this work. And I, what I'd like to do today is kind of very briefly review the Atlanta Fed's approach to this very important topic, but then really focus more today on some of the action items that the Atlanta Fed has been undertaking in the last year. So in a certain sense, you could think about this as a applied version of Dr. Howard's talk um, and telling you what we're doing and potentially what you could be doing with some of the tools that are out there right now. Before I begin, I do just want to remind everyone that the views I express are my own and are not necessarily those of the Atlanta Fed or the Federal Reserve System, but it's excellent to be here. I'd like to remind everyone on the Atlanta Fed's approach to the benefits cliffs is a little bit different than many of the other approaches out there. And it's different because we, we really do come at it from a workforce and jobs focus. And the reason we do that is because we, we do think that um, workforce development programs, job training programs are really focused on career growth, right? The basic models are usually built on moving workers into entry-level jobs and allowing them to have advancement opportunities so they can move up a career path over time. That's in essence, what's called the career pathway model. You may have heard of it, or you may be you know, very familiar with it, depending on what organization you work with. I just put an example on the screen right now, not, not necessary to focus on all the details, but this is from one of our partners in the Charlotte, North Carolina area. 
And it's just pointing out that they're focused on training workers for two different pathways in the healthcare industry because the business community and the community development uh, ecosystem in this area has determined that these two careers provide good entry level jobs for workers and offer advancement potential. You may be familiar, for example, with what we see on the very bottom of this chart. This is the so-called certified nursing assistant career path. It's, it's one of many that can start out at CNA. But the logic is in brief that a worker can start out as a CNA making uh, entry an approximately entry level salary, go back to school and move up over time. Now our career pathway approach is um, with the benefits list basically says, let's take these models and see what they look like for workers over time, if they're workers facing benefits cliffs. And I, I argue that that's critical because if we look at participants in workforce development programs, we know that a significant percentage of workforce development program participants, some community college enrollees, even four year university enrollees are on public assistance. So just in brief, our approach in our tools always would start out with, in this case, it's from an example we call a hypothetical worker named Leah. It takes that very same career pathway and puts it in a career planning approach. What you see on your screen right now is just gross income. So employment income for a worker that starts out at age 25, going to age 45 in three jobs, staying in a near minimum wage job over time, that's the red line, advancing to a CNA, that entry level job in that's the orange line, and then advancing even farther and becoming a licensed practical nurse. And that's the green line. These lines all starting from left to right slope up over time because we do assume that a worker starts out at an entry level wage and those earnings grow over time. Now, there's a dip at age 27, you can see there, that's not a benefits cliff, just so you know, that's where we assume a worker has to go down to part-time work to go to school full-time. But all I want everyone to take away from this chart is that it looks like career advancement pays off. The LPN earns more than the CNA, with, who earns more than the entry-level job, right? That green line is much higher. But what our tools usually do for both policymakers and practitioners is to say, let's transform this into a benefits cliff view. And in fact, what a worker like Leia would actually face is what you see on your screen right here. Now, this is the benefits cliff view of those same careers. And ignoring the complexity for a moment, I just want everyone to see that the actual choice that a worker is making is far more complex itself, right? Because rather than those very smooth, increasing earnings over time lines I just showed you, we instead see this phenomenon. And in fact, you can notice that I put the break even line on this chart. What that means is that at the points at which these lines are below the break even point, this family does not have the financial resources necessary to pay their basic expenses at an adequate level. So for the early years of this worker's career, they're in a, a position of financial stress and insecurity. Right when we're asking them to enroll in programs to move into higher paying jobs. So it provides a visualization of some of the barriers, the financial barriers, even ignoring the benefits cliffs that a worker may face. Now our tool that I'll talk about in just a second provides both practitioners and policymakers a visualization of where these barriers would be for a worker. I've highlighted three on this chart. Starting in the lower left corner, we have a benefits plateau. Now that's a, a phenomenon in which you can see that that CNA line is relatively flat for four years. That means that even though that worker's earnings are going up, they're in a sense just treading water, right? It's in this, really it's a, you can think about it a little bit more mathematically as roughly 100% tax rate on that worker's earnings. It's not a benefits cliff, but it's a position of even though that worker is earning more, they're seeing their paycheck go up, they're not seeing their family of standard living go up. Right? The benefits cliff there you can see is um, roughly at age 30 on the green line. That's a true benefits cliff when this family would lose childcare assistance. And then a little bit farther up the chart, you can see there's that, uh, what I call a low incentive to advance to an LPN. 
right? And all that means there is that the, the gap between the LPN and the CNA is much smaller than it was in that first chart I showed you. And all that means is that when we were telling a job candidate that you're gonna really experience a payoff if you take that sacrifice, go to school for a year, become an LPN. Well, in actuality, because of the benefits cliff phenomenon, that incentive has been reduced. So again, you know, what this approach I hope shows you is that the set of barriers that a family may face is significant and prolonged, right? It's not a one-time situation. And, and the policy response we need to think about is a holistic policy response that can target all these different pain points that families face. Okay. There's a, lo a lot of um, common strategies I've seen. Uh, some of this, would, most of this was covered in Dr. Howard's presentation. And I'll just say that across three domains is where the Atlanta Fed's been working. Mapping the benefits cliffs, that is providing policymakers with the knowledge they need to take action on these issues. Second, workforce development programs. And that involves kind of career coaching, program design. And then third would be policy simulation and changes. So the Atlanta Fed works with partners to learn what policy solutions they're considering, simulate those changes for our partners so they can see in real time what the effect on families and what the ROI for the taxpayer would be. Right? So that's the, in a sense, three domains of activity right now for the Atlanta Fed. I'm gonna say there's three foundations of our work that I'd like you all to know about. The first is the customized clip. Customized. The first is the customized CLIF dashboard. CLIF stands for Career Ladder Identifier and Financial Forecaster. This is, we customize this tool for partners in a very localized level and for the career paths they want us to, to build out. Now, this is a, a tool that provides at a minimum, all the charts I just showed you, but also again, that ROI for the taxpayer, a documentation of all the benefits cliffs that a family may hit, as well as the path to self-sufficiency. That is, it would help a policymaker and a worker see, well, given my career choice, what actually is my path, for example, to the Alice threshold or the MIT living wage or the University of Washington self-sufficiency standard or the Florida self-sufficiency standard? Or perhaps Palm Beach County has their own standard for what they want to see families get at. The tool is very customized so that you can take those local metrics and put them into this tool. The second is the Cliff Personal Planner, which we just call the Cliff Tool. This is more for coaching. You know, so if you're doing one-on-one -on -one coaching that combines both career coaching and a benefits Cliffs analysis, the Cliff Personal Planner is what we're deploying for those purposes. So we have partnerships with Goodwill, um, various job centers, um, including in Florida, um, that are using that will be using this planner. And really, it's we'd like to think about this as more of the TurboTax benefits Cliff tool, career planner, whereas that first tool I showed you is really more of the uh, I would call it more of the tableau of our of our tool suite. Third is uh, the third foundation of our work is what we're calling the policy rules database. And for anyone out there who's a researcher or building their own benefits cliffs tools that maybe that are um, for your own organization, we do provide a public resource that is a national database of public assistance rules and taxes. Um, so if you're interested in th this kind of research or knowledge base, or as I said, you know, local tool development, this is a resource that we provide um, to interested users. So again, that's the, the policy rules database. All of this information is on our website and um, I'll distribute the slides with this link. Um, this is just a screenshot of our homepage for the Advancing Careers for Low Income Families Initiative at the Atlanta Fed. Now I'm gonna conclude um, with an example of some of the work we're doing um, in, in the policy simulation front. Now we have partnerships across three different buckets, I would say. We have, starting on the left of this screen, we have a combination of partnerships at the federal, state and community level focused on policy solutions, right? And that's the policy solution piece. The second is we have partnerships on career coaching. Right? And that's, again, we're working with organizations such as Goodwill, such as uh, CareerSource in Florida, 
to really use this technology to inform job seekers about the gains to career advancement, but also if they do face a financial barrier, um, can we plug in some mitigation strategies or wraparound supports to help that worker? Okay. And then third is employer solutions. So working with employers and what can employers do um, in this kind of work? I'm not gonna focus as much on, on that today, uh, mainly because that work also in our portfolio is a little early on. Okay. The Atlanta Fed has partnerships um, across the country um, in those three buckets. This is just a map. Um, the gold states indicate areas in which we have partnerships on this cliff tool. So you can see there's pretty good coverage, uh, certainly in the east and the south, um, on states that are very interested in this kind of work. This is an example of what um, the project in Connecticut, um, and they created this website that talks about their initiative at the state level and using this cliff tool and what they seek to gain from this kind of analysis to inform the really impressive and I think uh, leading thought that's going on in that state about different solutions across both policy and practice for families that are facing benefits cliffs. Last is examples. I'm gonna just provide a couple quick ones here because I know we're limited on time. I'm gonna skip ahead to my last example. Now, that, not, not to say that this is the, the right solution, but it is one we've been asked to analyze with our partners, and it is guaranteed income pilots. So some of you may have heard that, you know, across the country, some communities are starting these guaranteed basic income pilots. Um, examples include Stockton, California, Jackson, Mississippi, Chicago, Atlanta, Newark. And the idea here is that you're going to provide a family with just unconditional cash right, perhaps in place of safety net programs, right, for a limited amount of time. And the idea is that's going to provide more financial security and a, um, um, uh, the more financial security in the short term to allow that family to meet their basic needs and then promote their own economic mobility. So just for example, in Stockton, that guaranteed income program gives families $500 a month for two years. And it's unconditional cash transfer. So what we were asked, we've been asked to do is say, well, what is the effect of these programs on families and how does it actually interact with the benefits cliff? Because it's a, it's a very interesting problem if you think about it. If you as a community are designing a guaranteed income pilot, the $500 a month is going to affect your safety net eligibility, creating a type of benefits cliff. Right? So you have to design these programs so it doesn't actually make the family worse off or their guaranteed income is completely offset by the by a loss in public assistance. Okay. So just give you a quick example of how this kind of analysis works. This is a, a, a box around a small benefits cliff. That's This is for a hypothetical family in Richmond. You can see that this family would be losing some public assistance at about $29,000 a year, right? So that's a barrier for this family. The second issue here is that notice that the blue line there, that's the family's net financial resources or disposable income, is quite significantly below zero, which means this family has what I'm calling a self-sufficiency gap. They don't have enough money to pay their basic expenses. So right away, I'd be flagging something. This family has two barriers to family financial well-being and mobility, the benefits cliff and the self-sufficiency gap. So what can guaranteed income do in this case and how could it exacerbate uh, the benefits cliff, right? Now, the first way to look about it is, is in the following sense. The red line here is the typical amount of money a family gets that's enrolled in a job training program. So across the country for federal programs and federal job training programs, the, the families in those programs are making about $6,000 a year. That is a, obviously a position far below that self-sufficiency target. Now, for a family like this, guaranteed income would have the following effect. It's going to make them better off considerably by pushing their net financial resources over about $12,000 with very little impact on the uh, safety net. Right? So that's a, that's a, that's a, a positive. Right? Now, the second way to think about it is, well, what's the effect on that benefits cliff? Now, some of the program uh, we were actually analyzing was, was actually targeting families that were earning right about where that red line is. So they weren't giving the guaranteed income to families that weren't making any money. It was targeted to families that are in jobs right now that are 
really um, um, at a, in low in lower wage jobs that are really trying to advance. So I just put it here example. The red line is what the salary is for an entry level nursing assistant. What is the guaranteed income going to do for this family? Because they're right on the edge of the benefits cliff. The guaranteed income moves that family for the two years right past that benefits cliff. So it actually works out quite well in this case, right? So the, the guaranteed income pilot does, in a sense, mitigate this benefits cliff, at least for the duration of the program. So I just want to summarize what that just showed, right? So guaranteed income can, according to this analysis at least, can both mitigate a benefit cliff and provide financial security. For the case I showed you, now, what's important to remember is that like all of these policies that we, I think we're talking about today, if we want to implement them locally, it requires a really comprehensive analysis to see how does your proposed change affect not just this one hypothetical family I showed you today, but your whole target population. Because the interaction of all these policy changes with benefits and other benefits and, and really just is going to, it creates a complexity that you need to be aware of to really make an impactful choice. So thank you very much for that brief introduction to our work and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Ritter. Um, I think what I'd like to follow up on, you mentioned in, it looks like in the, the map of the United States that Florida is one of those green uh, gold partners. So the question really is, can you talk about the status of the partnerships in terms of using the tools where it's been effective and then also talk a bit about its use in Florida? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll talk. So the, all three of the Florida partnerships are only just now getting started. And we're working with uh, Broward College, uh, working with Career Source and Florida Goodwill. Right now, those partnerships actually are touching all three buckets. Right, where we, we want to work with an employer, we want to work with career coaching, and we want to look at uh, proposed policy and workforce development changes. Right. So this work is only right now setting the groundwork. Really what that means is we're getting the information we need right now to build the tools that Florida needs, right? So that's where we are in Florida. And I think we're, we're very excited about that work. The, where the, the, the programs actually are in place are right now in other states, like such as Alabama and Connecticut, it being used right now for the policy simulation, right? So each of those states and others really does have like a bipartisan senior level committee, if you will, right? Um, and this could be either in like a local level um, or at a state level, right? You, you really just need some group that can develop some kind of consensus on what the community wants to pursue in terms of policy. Those recommendations are given to us. We produce the analysis for them and then return those results so they have that information they need to make the changes. We've already seen uh, some, some of our partner states, um, uh, in a sense, adopt, you know, at least pilot programs um, in their state policy to, to see how those changes are gonna mitigate cliffs for families, right? So we're really excited about that work. And the coaching front, at least with our tool, those pilots literally just started last week, right? And we're, to be honest, in the, for us at least, we're really interested right now is, are these tools empowering the counselors uh, and the career coaches to be more comfortable talking about these complex issues with their clients, right? Because uh, we find that, you know, again, the information is so complex, you know, oftentimes maybe a, you know, a, a career coach has an expertise in one program, but has questions about the other six their client may be on, right? They have questions about how they interact with the top jobs that are recommended by the state that they focus on. We're hoping our tool is making their job easier and allowing them to be more effective and efficient, which is what we're focused on measuring for the least of the next two months. And then when we're, I would say also in about a two month period, we're gonna start looking at how well, how's it affecting the families that are using the tool? That really is very exciting. And it's exciting to hear about the ability to even customize it, to use it at a local level. So that's something certainly to think about. Um, there was one technical question actually came up a couple of times in terms of your longitudinal uh, charts. The question is, it, are you factoring in a cost of living or other kinds of increases um, as you are looking at those trends? Mm -hmm. 
That's a good question. So co local cost of living is part of our tool and we consider it an essential part of our tool, right? Because we want to we want to know for a given career choice that you're recommending to a family, when is that job going to pay off for them? Meaning that they're going to be able to live at a reasonable level, given your local cost of living. Right. So we absolutely incorporate that. So the tool I showed you just now includes the, the cost of livings from the university of Washington self-sufficiency standard. We're also really excited to start bringing in the United way Alice data. Um, so really the cost of living is going to be United Way Alice, and you're going to look at, you're going to be able to see how does a job as earnings grow over time, get you to the Alice threshold, right? So you're, you're moving more Florida families above the Alice threshold, which is a, I think a goal we all can agree on, right? So, so the first, the answer to the first question is absolutely. The second part about growth over time. Now we do um, all the, the earnings and the cost of living is already inflation adjusted, right? So it's all in kind of today's dollars. Uh, we've explored off some different types of in inflation metrics. Like do we let healthcare expenses grow higher more than housing expenses? Uh, but we haven't pursued that yet. But the, the critical thing is that these are inflation adjusted numbers. Thank you so much. And are the tools available even if you're not a partner or how does that work? The tools will be um, publicly available like for, for the state once they're, they're finished. I mean, we, you know, we're not gonna, we can't, we, we certainly wouldn't restrict access. Um, but you know, the one thing is with, uh, when we partner with a group, we, we usually do have a, a stronger commitment to customization and, and training um, of, of, with the tool. Right. So, you know, some of the tools are already available if you wanted to go to our website and, and see how um, some of the benefits clips look in Florida. Uh, you can go there and find that out, you know, right now. Uh, but, you know, we hope to have the full functioning Florida tool in the next couple months, which will also be on our website. That's terrific. It's really exciting to see that there is a tool that policymakers can actually look at and understand the impact of the policies they're considering and implementing. So that's amazing. Uh, there was one additional question which said, can you elaborate a bit more on the policy rules database and how we can use those tools locally? The policy rules database is, is a resource that, again, you can find on our website. There's a data use agreement associated with it because we do uh, the really one restriction on access is this for kind of nonprofit use. Um, not, it's not for profit use. Um, this, we, we've tried to take the, the incredibly complex rules of all federal programs and condense them into like a single, easy to use, unified language uh, for researchers and tool developers. I mean, it's still, there's still going to be a little hurdle for you if you're uh, unfamiliar with with this work to understand what the, the or understand how to use the database. There is a manual online though that can help you. Um, but if you are interested in that kind of work, I highly recommend um, going to this, going to our website, taking a look at the manual and requesting access to the data. Um, it's, it's, it's a resource we're, we're, we're very happy to share with the community. Terrific, thank you so much. Okay, this is really amazing so far. I would like to introduce now our third panelist. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to Ms. Kimberly Bush. She's the executive director and founder of Pathways to Prosperity, which is charged with the agency's mission to strengthen communities by improving the social, mental, spiritual, economic, and emotional well being of children and families in Palm Beach County through education and social services. A native of Palm Beach County, Ms. Bush has worked in the social work industry for more than 30 years. She's an addictions professional, relapse prevention specialist, and is skilled in program development, grant writing, leadership development, motivational speaking, grants management, and strategic planning. Ms. Bush has a passion for helping people to develop a vision for their lives and achieving that vision. Her faith and family in God is apparent in everything she does. I'd like to now take the time to uh, have you uh, listen to Ms. Bush. And so welcome, Ms. Bush. Thank you, Dr. King, for that introduction. Uh, first of all, I wanna just say that I'm really excited to be here with you all 
I'm trying to get this screen sharing going. So give me a second, screen share. Here we are. I'm excited to be here and, and be on this um, panel with these experts and bring in transparency and awareness to the cliff effect. It is a, it's real, it's real for the families that we work with. So how is Pathways to Prosperity addressing the cliff effect? We are working alongside Circles USA as a partner in utilizing LEAP Fund's cliff effect calculator. Circles USA is a national model. It's operating in nearly 30 states across this country and in parts of Canada. Pathways partnered with Circles USA in 2014 to become the lead agency to offer circles in Palm Beach County. Recently, we became one of the pilot chapters to introduce the LEAP Fund Cliff Effect Calculator here in Palm Beach County. So just a bit about the circles model. Uh, the, the circles movement is all about moving families out of poverty and then beginning to remove those barriers that keep families trapped in poverty. So how do we do that? We have our clients who we call circle leaders because they're leading their circle. And we surround them with supports that would be able to assist them in, in training in getting to um, networking within their communities. But more importantly, within the first 18 weeks, our families are going through trainings where they're learning about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. They're looking at decision-making. They're beginning to set SMART goals, goals that they can set for themselves. But what is really unique about this program is the ally piece. Because one of the things that the families that we work with is having that support system around them that's gonna help them while they're on this journey to self-sufficiency. Um, the allies are middle to upper income individuals who make a commitment to come alongside one family and help guide them to self-sufficiency. So they're not giving them anything other than a listening ear, support and encouragement like many of us need on our journey. Um, we do have teams that we've set up. We've got our jobs and education team that is working with families to help them to get um, jobs that would get them to those living wages. Uh, we have a community team that's getting our families involved with uh, the local um, city councils. We have a recruitment team that's recruiting allies and recruiting circulators for this team. And then we do our policy work in big view. Once a month, we get together with our circle leaders who graduated from the program, along with some other interested community members. And we talk about those issues that are keeping our families locked in poverty. And then how do we address them? We're doing letter writing campaigns to our local legislators, but just really getting the voice of the clients to be heard. So how does the fiscal cliff affect our clients? So as Josephine and Alex have said, imagine your family, you're an individual and you're making $15 an hour. You receive a raise and now you're making $17 and you're excited. But once you get it, you find out that you're gonna lose your childcare subsidy, which is worth about $900 a month, which is roughly a little over $10,000 a year. This is a scenario that is, that is faced by many of the clients that we are working with on a daily basis. So we're having them, they're turning down raises because they're afraid of this cliff. So what this work does and this benefits calculator is that it provides a conversation for our coaches to begin to have a conversation with our clients, an informed conversation and help to prepare them for the cliff before it happens. So I just did an infographic or had my staff to help me with it to just kind of demonstrate what I just said, just said on why turn down the raise. So we have her here, we have Tanya making $15 an hour, but then she, gets a raise of $1.50. And as you can see, she loses a big part of her benefit. So it's kind of difficult for us to get clients right off the ground to say, you know, go ahead and take that raise. Sometimes they kind of delay it until they can get to the point where they're going to be able to get to that point that Alex was talking about, where they're able to jump over that cliff. So 
how does the benefit calculator help us? Again, it is a conversation that our coaches are having with the clients as they're setting goals. They're going with them one-on-one, -on -one, preparing them so that they know, and then putting a plan in place to kind of help them as they're on this journey to self-sufficiency. And then it also helps our clients while they're on the journey to also look at what benefits that they might be eligible for that they're not receiving. We have found already that there are clients that are not receiving some medical benefits, for instance, that would really assist them and help them while they're on this journey towards self-sufficiency. Um, this has been some exciting work for us and we've been doing it now, as I mentioned earlier, since 2014. And we've had clients that have, of course, they've purchased homes, they've, they've really changed their life trajectory, but then a lot of them have moved out of Palm Beach County because they couldn't afford the cost of living. So we want our families to be able to, to advance and then stay local where they're able to thrive right here around their support system. So how can you help us in this work? We invite you to get involved with Circles Palm Beach County as we secure the future for our families. You can become an ally, you can go to our website, um, and sign up to become an ally, to work with the circle leader where you say, you know what, I'm going to do this work and I'm going to come alongside one family. If each of us would take one family, we're affecting quite a number of individuals in Palm Beach County. Um, if you don't have time for that, there's also our Big View policy meetings where we meet once a month. And it's where we get to hear from our circle leaders, from our families, what is affecting them, whether it be childcare, whether it be affordable housing, but what is the issue that you want us to help you work on? It's not about the agency or the leaders doing the work, it's the circle leaders themselves, the clients actually having their voices heard. And then of course, you can always attend a community meeting with our circle leaders, which is the participants of our program. I know it's kind of short. I know that Alex and Josephine gave us tons of information on what we can do at the federal and state level, but this is what we're doing on the ground solutions to um, work with families right here in Palm Beach County to deal with this benefits cliff. So thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Bush. I did want to follow up. You mentioned that you've heard a lot about what's happening at the national and state level. Is there anything that uh, maybe you would want to take away from today's conversation and think about applying here locally? I will tell you that as Alex was talking about the guaranteed income pallets, I'm definitely list, um, wanting to find out more information about that. I believe that is something that would definitely help our families. But there's a wealth of information and strategies that I've heard today that we'll kind of process with my team and see what we can get going with the Securing Our Future initiative and the other agencies that are working with that. Wonderful. Thank you. I mean, I think today's conversation amongst the panelists has really given us a nice view of the context at a federal level. We've certainly heard how COVID is adding to the complications of the benefits cliff. We've also heard about how states are trying to address the benefits cliff, and there are a lot of unique examples of how the states are doing that, which might help us in Florida to really have some insights about how we may address it. We've also heard about a tool, which I think is amazing, that really is helping to inform our policymakers about the impacts of the policies that they're considering and implementing, and really what that impact means for people, real people who are dealing with these cliffs every day. We've heard from a local example, Pathways to Prosperity of just one organization. There are many who are working directly with individuals every day, who are trying to do their best to pull themselves out of poverty and having the ability to understand these cliffs, the ability to plan for and jump over them is so incredibly important. So this has been really great um, information and a very nice view, sort of federal, down to state, down to local. We've certainly had a lot of conversation locally about how can we uh, weigh in on state policy, but also on local policy? Certainly there are a lot of things locally. We've got a lot of opportunity here to think about what we can do locally to help mitigate 
some of these things as we're working on a state policy. So I don't really take away from this a one or the other, but an opportunity to build upon a variety of strategies. So I do want to make sure I open up the conversation for any additional questions. Um, the work that's happening at all three levels is amazing and certainly is, it makes me optimistic that we will begin to approach and address these cliffs um, and that's really vital work. So I don't see any additional questions. James, may I hand it over to you? Uh Absolutely. I'll, absolutely. Thank you. I'm, so, I'm really happy to let me introduce James Green. I know he, <laughs> he mentioned himself earlier. James is the director for the Community Services Department at the Palm Beach, in Palm Beach County. And we're so excited that the Citizens Advisory Com Committee has the opportunity to work so closely with James and all of the county staff. They're really amazing. They've done a lot of work, especially during COVID, to provide support and relief to so many in our community. They go above and beyond every day, bring tremendous heart. And the vision that James brings for the work through the uh, Community Services Department, but also in partnership with the CAC, is one that I really think is going to make a difference in this community. And so I'm excited and certainly pleased to support him in that vision. And so with that, I will hand it over to you, James. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Dr. Kane. And it's just awesome working with you. Uh, I love the way you think. I, I love the way you articulate and, uh, and you know, just guide this process. And, and, you know, this is systems work. This is lake work. We talk about the fish in the lake. This is the lake work um, that is so meaningful to so many of our, uh, our re residents, our vulnerable residents. And so I, you know, I just want to kind of end by saying thank you to uh, again, our moderator, Dr. Kane, who uh, facilitated uh, this discussion wonderfully. I want to thank our panelists uh, for sharing such insightful information. Remember, this is uh, this this uh, webinar will be is recorded, and uh, and so we'll we'll uh, be sharing this information, uh, you know, as as broadly as possible to make sure that people are educated about uh, the benefits clip. Uh, and then I want to thank my team, and especially Jody, who did a lot to facilitate uh, this workshop. And uh, as she mentioned, uh, there we have a workshop plan on social capital. Uh, we have some great uh, presenters uh, nationally and locally uh, that will be participating in that workshop. And uh, I, I do want to make sure that uh, we recognize Kim and Kim uh, and Pathways has been a, a tremendous partner in this work. We're so happy that, uh, that we're able to partner with uh, Circles and also we're bringing on and expanding our partnership. We have housing authorities who are now part of securing our future. We've connected with the purpose-built community and the work that they're doing and community partners uh, on this initiative. We, we have found ways to be as innovative and to, to really uh, collaborate in a way uh, to, to be able to see what works best and how we can uh, best create opportunities for our families. I want to mention a couple of other things. Uh, we, are, we do have a, a, a policy work group uh, that is a part of the Securing Our Future initiative. And so we'll be connecting with some of the other uh, policy work groups uh, that um, are there. And, and that work group is really uh, there to listen to the lived experience. Kim mentioned the big view uh, in terms of what they're, they're doing with uh, some of the families. Uh, we, that's a core component of uh, the Securing Our Future initiative is that we go to the community and we listen to those individuals who are going through these experiences, uh, dealing with the challenges of, of the fiscal cliff. And we take those lived experiences and determine and, and ask them what they feel the solutions will be. And we also are looking to code that information and determine what local state and federal policies are preventing them from accessing services or um, moving up economically. And we're utilizing that information to, uh, to develop a prioritized policy agenda uh, that we will take to the county's legislative affairs office, that we will uh, present to the birth to 22 uh, legislative committee that has a lobbyist from the state college, CSC, ELC, the school district and others on that committee, and that we will present to the Human Services Coalition 
um, there, so that they can make it a part of their green book, which is uh, a prioritized policy agenda that they uh, use to, to lobby to state legislators. And so we're really excited about uh, this uh, integrated approach to, to leverage our community partnerships and to listen to our families and to, and to treat the lake while we are supporting uh, uh, the families that are living in poverty. And we invite you, if you would like to participate, you can go to securingourfuturepbc.org. That's securingourfuturepbc.org. There are videos, there are PowerPoint presentations, there are all types of information. Uh, this, this is where uh, this conversation will, will be um, posted. All types of information about the work that we've been doing as a Citizens Advisory Committee, as the Birth to 22 uh, Alliance to address uh, poverty here in Palm Beach County. So with that, um, I just want again to say thank you for joining us today. I, I don't know if there's